everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Christina and I'm the events coordinator here at Books Are Magic. Before we get started, I wanted to point out some logistics for how tonight's going to go. First off, we ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. We'll be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so start thinking of questions to ask now. After the talk tonight, Allison will be signing books at the desk near where you checked in. We also have additional books available to purchase from my colleague at the register. If you're joining us virtually on the live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of Recipe for Disaster Online using the link in the live stream, live stream description. It's my pleasure to be here tonight with Allison Riley, Jacqueline Woodsey, and Lori Willever to celebrate Recipe for Disaster. Recipe for Disaster is a collection of stories and recipes about finding comfort in food, surviving the unthinkable, and living to tell about both. There are 40 recipes, some traditional, some unconventional, that commemorate the low points with the same culinary conviction with which we celebrate the highs. Part cookbook, part candid confessions, this book of good food for bad times reminds us that even the worst of days yield something worth sharing. Allison Riley is a writer and creative director based in Brooklyn and Hudson, New York. She's also the founder of the Paper and Text Studio Set Editions. Originally from Massachusetts, she moved to New York City to study creative writing and has spent the last 25 years working inside brands and businesses as an advisor to creators of all kinds, from musicians to art directors and writers to fashion designers. This is her first book. As I mentioned earlier, Allison will be joined in conversation tonight by Jacqueline Woodson and w Lori Willever. Lori Willever is a writer and editor and spent nearly a decade assisting Anthony Bourdain, with whom she co-authored Appetites, a Cookbook, and World Travel, an Irreverent Guide. She's written about food and travel for the New York Times, GQ, Food and Wine, as well as many others, and has worked at, as an editor at all, <laughs> Art Culinary and Wine Spectator. Jacqueline Woodson is the recipient of an astounding number of literature awards and fellowships. Her best-selling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, won the National Book Award, as well as the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Honor, and the NAACP Image Award. She's written dozens of other award-winning books for young people, as well as the adult books Red at the Bone, a New York Times bestseller, and Another Brooklyn, a 2016 National Book Award finalist. Let's all give a very warm welcome to Allison, Jacqueline, and Lori. Thank you so much to Books Are Magic um, for letting me be here tonight. Thank you so much to Jackie and to Lori for being here with me and to Chronicle for making it happen. And thank you for being here. I feel like I know everybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just saying, I don't think that talking into a microphone and remembering things is something I can do at the same time. So forgive me while I use these notes compared to these two people. I feel like an amateur, but this is how I'll remember what I'm trying to say. Um, Recipe for Disaster is comprised of 40 stories from incredibly interesting creative thinkers of all stripes, musicians and restaurant owners, chefs and food writers, authors and comedians, fashion designers and photographers, um, of whom I asked the same question, which was, can you name a low point in your life and the food memory you associate with surviving it? Um, I collected their stories through as many ways, um, through stream of consciousness voice notes, through uh, sc scraps of emails, through photographs of words, through conversations over dinner, it's a lot of Zoom, text messages, phone calls. Um, I collected them during COVID, which of course is its own disaster, and in many ways this project was for me the recipe for enduring that. Uh, despite the fact that this is called a cookbook, I feel like I should come out as someone who does not cook at all. Um, and to that end, having recipes is essential. Um, I have no foundation to draw on, and I have no imagination when it comes to cooking. Um, I started this project because I am significantly more fluent in low points than I am in food. 
to me, this book was about talking about experiences that can be isolating or that we believe we are meant to endure alone and bringing ritual and purpose and levity to those days um, and creating community around them, uh, particularly where there is often just silence. Uh, having come through a series of disasters as a young person, I have truthfully felt out of step with most of my peers for most of my life. And uh, I've always found community with people who have been through the ringer. Those bonds were not forged necessarily in crisis or in sadness, but in just a specific and shared intelligence, uh, an earned kind of wisdom. Um, the common experience of just being outside the normal. And within that community, I learned that things can be awful and hilarious, or grave and absurd, or devastating and a huge relief. Um, you could be bereft and hopeful at the same time. And this book was my attempt at exemplifying that. And the stories I got back were as various. Some of them are hilarious. I think Samantha Irby's story will make anyone laugh out loud. Um, some of them were not hilarious, but surprising. Uh, Sarah Silverman's story will not make you laugh out loud. Um, some of them are rebellious. Ron Finley effectively told me that my premise was false and that he did not carry any emotional memory with any of his experiences and neither should I. Um, and Emily King told me a story that was uniquely embarrassing and took place on the stage of Radio City Music Hall, which I think speaks to the scale at which she felt that embarrassment. Um, coincidentally, I was in the crowd that night that she had such an embarrassing moment. And while I don't think anybody thought about it much after that, that's certainly not like Emily did, I do understand why it was indelible, and I do understand why she wanted to get it out of her body. Um, Jacqueline and, um, and Lori both contributed stories to this book, and I feel really lucky to have had them. Um, Lori, yours was the first story that I got back after sending this prompt out. Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure I knew that. That's... Yeah, it was the first time I thought maybe the book this book might be real. Wow. Um, and as I knew you would, your response was so tight and precise and perfect. You nailed the prompt perfectly. I had, I had, the story was, I mean, as soon as I got your email, I was like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do. So I, wondered, was, I felt like it was, this was a very um, preordained sort of uh, partnership. Yeah. Um, to be honest, you know, I, my first introduction to you, I don't know if you remember, 10 years ago, yeah. <laughs> um, you bought, in another part of my life, I make a set of glasses that have the stages of grief on them. And I recognized your name, but I couldn't pinpoint why. Mm -hmm. And I Googled you and remembered who you were. And then I sent you some stuff and a yes. note to say that I was appreciative that you appreciated the yeah. sensibility. They were so funny. The I still have the cards that say, stop talking. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, anyway, I wondered if you'd read your story. Sure. Is it... Uh, I can... Mm -hmm. Right there. Sure. Hi, I'm Lori. Uh, so this story is called The Best of the Worst. I have to remember to put my glasses on. Okay. A few years ago, in late spring, my unhappy marriage imploded, messily, ine inevitably, one terrible Monday night. It was both a massive relief and a terrifying tectonic shift. I started sleeping on the couch. The next morning, I made an emergency call to my longtime therapist, but she couldn't really talk for long, she said, because her husband had just died unexpectedly violently, and the police were still in her home. I turned to the non-professional advice of others. My boss, Tony Bourdain, who was a mentor to me and many others, a generous, charismatic, mysterious and brilliant person around whom many universes were centered, was reassuring when I told him that I was getting divorced and looking for a new home. He'd been through it too. 
It's going to suck a lot at first, he said, but then you're going to realize how much better off you are. Don't get a shitty apartment because you think you can't afford something better, he said. Whatever you need, I will help you. I got myself a good apartment, secure in the knowledge that he would have my back. A month later, he took his own life. I was subsisting on high chew candy and nicotine gum, too unmoored and anxious to eat normally. On the day that the news of Tony's death broke, a cruelly bright and perfect summer Friday, my friend Allison invited me her into her cool shaded kitchen, handed me a can of seltzer, and made me a bowl of soft scrambled eggs, the best thing I'd eaten or would eat that summer. And then there's a recipe for soft scrambled eggs. <laughs> sort of answered the question I was going to ask, but you knew immediately what you were going to... How far between this story and my question? I think it was probably a year, year and a half maybe from yeah. that time. I just, I don't really remember, but I know I was just kind of in the thick of writing the uh, world travel book and the biography, so it was just like, you know, oh great. I don't know if you had this experience when you're working on your book, but when some other project comes, especially if it's small and easily managed, it's like, yes, I don't have to do my thing. So I was very happy to hear from you. Did you know what you were going to write about when you got the prompt? I didn't. I knew the recipe, but I didn't know what I was going to write about. Okay. You uh, were actually the last person I asked to be in the book, and I think that is because I had to ask 39 other people to have the confidence to ask you to be a part of it. Um, the thing that is so incredible about your story is that it literally exemplifies how community turns a circumstance from negative to positive. That um, something meager becomes grand when you share it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a metaphor for the premise. Uh, thanks, Alice. Yeah. Yeah. It's the last dog here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chicken. Again. My mom couldn't cook. She tried, we didn't starve. We circled the table every evening, not so much dreading what was put down in front of us, but what the unwe four kids in Brooklyn by way of the South should never have to bring to the dinner table. I always chose the window seat. There was a gutter drain just outside of it, and this is where so much of my dinner ended up. Once as a child, I put liver and onions in my pocket and later had to lie away the cause of the grease stains. Lumpy grits, thick, undercooked Aunt Jemima pancakes, pink bone chicken, cube steaks like chewing gum, dry and blistered porgies, the list went on and on. My sister, younger brother, and I were underweight. My older brother, existing on a diet of mayonnaise sandwiches, junk food, and bodega heroes, was not. Still, we survived. I credit a lot of that survival to my best friend Maria's mother. Maria lived three doors away, and her mother pulled magic out of her refrigerator and kitchen cabinets. Rice and chicken stews, arroz con pollo. Pigeon peas with bits of beef, deep fried pastelillos, chicken soups. Yes, it was still chicken, but it wasn't. And we survived, too, because my grandmother joined us in Brooklyn when we were still young and took over the cooking. A southern woman to the core, my grandmother was both a gardener and a chef. She and my mother turned our backyard into a world of milk crates, sprouting collards, lettuces, tomatoes, cucumbers, and herbs. My mother planted an apple in a pear tree that all these years later still bear fruit. A world became southern fried chicken and fried sweet potato pies. It became collards and collards cooked with smoked turkey wings and macaroni and cheese casseroles. It became homemade ice cream and ambrosia, pancakes from scratch with caramelized bananas. It became a world I walked into and discovered my own love of silent time in the kitchen, figuring out how to turn the old into the new. Chicken seemed to always be on sale somewhere in the Bushwick neighborhood of my childhood, and because of that, we ate it a lot. Now when I want to revisit the childhood from my grandmother's kitchen to Maria's mother's, this is the dish I find myself making. And the dish I make is, <laughs> arroz, um, is chicken stew, um, which is uh, 
variation on the arroz con pollo sans the arroz. <laughs> Um, not being a cook, when I think about where food and community meet, it's often in a restaurant. Mm. Um, there, are, I get a lot out of being a regular and sitting at the bar, making myself a part of the restaurant community. <laughs> um, it's now long gone, but the most, uh, the one that looms the largest and was the longest hub of my social world uh, was Florent. <laughs> yeah, um, I ate there three to five times a week for a decade, and those people who work there are still my friends. It was the great equalizer of restaurants in the sense that I mean, everybody ended up there at some point. It's like the airport, um, and it was open 24 hours a day. Um, anyway, for me, the community usually came first and the food followed, but I wondered if you built community around food first, or how you, what you think about when you think about the intersection of food and community? It's funny because, um, you know, of course I have such fond memories of Florent and the fact that walking over there, my beloved always knows, yeah, I was right here, but I lose my way in terms of how that part of the world, yeah. the meatpacking district so has different. so changed, sure. yeah. And I think, I think for, for us, they came kind of at the same time because of early on in, you know, my queer sort of late adolescence, we were having potlucks and, and bring, coming together around food. And the food, I think it's because our mics are so close together, and the food definitely got better as we got older until sure. the point where we started having kids. And I, I remember when my daughter was... Um, still a baby, uh, there was a, an editor, I, I, Eden, Eden Rock Lipson, who was at the New York Times doing the book, uh, book review for children, and she had told my friend Linda that you should always have family dinner, so um, for 20 years, until the kids started going off to college, we would gather every Sunday night for family mm -hmm. dinner, and that, that had such an impact on us as cooks, because we started cooking a lot more, and cooking a lot better, and on the kids in terms of that community, knowing that Sunday night it was going to be a sit-down meal with the extended family. Right. You've been in a part of so many restaurants or people who are restaurant adjacent. Do you? Is that does that mean that that's where the hub of your food community? Was that where it revolves around, or is that just what it looks like from here? Well, I think a lot of the people that I met in restaurants when I was younger and, and working closer to them are still my friends, and, and they became the early community of, of New York. But um, I don't feel that same way now. I feel like uh, getting farther away from restaurants, having a kid, I think I think it's, um, the, you know, it, it made me, the question made me realize that I don't actually have that much food community now. And I guess, you know, between COVID and having a teenager who just wants to watch um, South Park while he eats whatever I have cooked for him with zero acknowledgement of me and my existence in his life uh, is sort of, that's where I'm at currently. But when my son was younger uh, and there was this great thing that we did that was the most uh, it wasn't my idea, but I, I definitely took uh, great advantage of it. it was a, um, a four-family cooking co-op where everybody would cook something. We would have assigned categories, and every Sunday uh, we would get Sunday night we would get together and exchange portions of what we had made, so that then you would have a fridge full of stuff that you could easily heat up or cook quickly um, for the week. And we were all four families with young children, and. Um, that was great, and that really, I mean, that was the same thing. It was like you knew on Sunday you were going to get food for the week, and you were only going to have to cook once, but you would have enough for, you know, five meals. Um, and it was when everybody's kids were young enough to take naps, so it was like that's what you did on Sunday afternoon. And then once they dropped their naps, we all we kind of let this, the, the uh, had to let the co-op go a little bit. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think food, I mean, in general, I mean, it's it's a cliche, but I think it's true that, that a love of food or the act of preparing food or the act of coming together around a table is just a, it's an instant uh, community builder. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just, it's a cliche because it's true. Um, as I mentioned, I have made a lot of 
friends and family as maybe less cliche around grief. Mm. And I wondered, um, I wondered if you'd found friends or community around feelings where you hadn't expected to. I think it comes with having a child because you don't know what that's going to be like till you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think for me, it's definitely the dead mother club. Sure. You know, the I'm a nut. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, when someone loses their mom, it's I suddenly feel, feel like, oh, we we are on this certain side of a road, and we understand each other in a way that we didn't before. So there is definitely. I, I mean, I can just think off the top of my head of five of my friends who I know know more deeply because of the passing of their moms. Sure. I have a weird kind of radar for people who have lost parents. Mm -hmm. um, it's proven itself time and time again. Yeah, it, it, for as much as I think that I am ever evolving and becoming further and further away from that moment, it, it continues to be a compass of its own kind. Um, why do you think we don't come together around difficulty or hard times the way we do around happier days? You know, I'm not, I, I, you had asked that question a few days ago and I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure I agree with it. I, I feel like there really is, um, you know, I come from upstate New York, very uh, Catholic and Presbyterian Protestant uh, communities, Irish and German and, you know, American essentially. Uh, and it's, uh, it is casserole culture. And when somebody dies, your house fills up with casseroles and <laughs> cakes and, you know, just very kind of homey, uh, you know, stuff that's, that's comforting and so much cheese. And, um, so I think, I mean, I think that we do have our rituals. I don't think, I think we're not allowed to enjoy them as much. And I think right. there's an obvious, you know, reason for that, but I've been to some pretty fun, um, shivas. Too, I know, you know. <laughs> Shiva is the getting is getting it right. Yeah, I, I mean, depending right. on the circumstance of the death, but if it's some an elder, if it's not a tragedy, sure. I think it can actually. I've, I mean, they sometimes become the best parties. Yeah, I, I that for me, that's the only example where I think you're right that people bring food in times of sadness. But as some as someone who, in my most difficult times, I can't say I felt like a lot of people wanted to be around me. Mm -hmm. People, I, you know, I mean, I was a young person and it took people, like when I was inducted into the Dead Mothers Club <laughs> and I, I don't, I, I think people felt like I was jinxed. Uh, that's so interesting. In the black community, we have the repast and, mm -hmm. and I think the thing about the repast is that, you know, come together, bring food, to, um, pay homage to the person who passed and talk about them and then something some crazy shit always happens at it and because of that crazy shit we laugh for months and months so yeah. so it, it brings the humor but it is interesting when you I remember I had a friend in fifth grade who's um her it was a it was a blended family and the dad ended up shooting the mother of the other family and killing them uh, killing her and the, the girl returned to school and, and we were all we were like in awe of her and also didn't know what to do didn't right. know how to approach her and then when the teachers weren't saying you know when Sophia comes back to school here's what you do sure so so there was not a language around how one comforts someone's loss especially when you're young yeah well in even things that are not so grave I just don't I mean for as much as there's a drop-off idea of casseroles and cakes I don't I, I wish that there was more ritualistic togetherness around people's harder times um, or and and festivity like that you know I think there's a good time to be had <laughs> yeah yeah I mean the Irish I think get it right too yeah. you know I yes. mean that's just add whiskey right yeah, <laughs> but, uh, right. yeah. well with Could regard turn into its own disaster. <laughs> with regard to the dead mother club there's a, a something that I didn't realize happens uh, when my my mother is also dead, uh, and w it wasn't clear wh how long it was going to be. I was a little bit in denial that this was really happening, and you know, she was in hospice, but I was like, but is it really hospice? Like I was not sure. accepting it, and then I knew it was real when they brought in this. Um, it was at a nursing home, and they brought in this like tray, this cart, this rolling cart of coffee and tea and water and cookies and 
chips and I had never gotten so much as like a drink out of a water fountain at this place before and I was like oh like they don't give the cookies to you if your mom is just like has the flu like this wow. is you know it was like the cookie the the food really signified the the life stage that she was entering um and I was I was really psyched about those cookies like the Lorna Dunes and the Oreos <laughs> and that really made a big difference yeah. in the that let those next few days was the sustaining yeah yeah Sarah Silverman's cookie was the pinwheel mm. yeah um do you have other rituals around disasters do you are there other unusual things that have gotten you through a bad time Oh, I've so blocked it out if there are. I mean, the thing that gets me through every kind of time is writing. That's why I've written so many books. So, yeah. I mean, I do think that it, for me, it feels healing. It feels like a place where I can process what the loss was. I'm thinking now 9-11 when I was pregnant and just being in that moment, kind of just shutting down and going into the world of fiction as a way of understanding that moment and surviving it. Um, same thing with the pandemic. I mean, I feel like I had my head down writing through the whole pandemic and lifted my head up. It's like, oh, yay, we got a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I can start engaging in the world again. But I do tend to shut the world off when times are hard for me, even personally, like not reading newspapers or anything, just not taking in other stuff. Yeah, the only time in my life, I, well, like maybe 10 years ago, I was on a flight where they were showing a movie that made me remember that probably a decade before that I was living in Bushwick and I had an illegal cable box that played all the channels, really aging myself all the time, <laughs> including the pay-per-view channels, all four of them for free. Yes. <laughs> it was a, called a hot box. You had to pay a lot for the box, but then it was, that was it. That's so funny. Anyway, I had that box and I was unemployed and I looking back or when I remembered the movie I realized it's probably the only time in my life I think I was truly depressed because I lay in bed and watched Practical Magic which is a movie with Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock as witches and I watched it like three to five times a day just over and over and over again for like maybe four to six weeks and then I was through it and I I guess I felt better. I don't, I, and when I saw the movie on the plane, I remembered that that had happened, but I don't, I have no idea what happens in the movie. I have no memory of the movie whatsoever. But it is, I don't, but it was the thing that got me through a time. <laughs> I don't know. Unusual things that get you through disasters? Uh, high chew and... Yeah, high chew and, and uh, nicotine gum was the thing a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, I will say the two things, the two best uh, things that came to me when my mom died, uh, to, uh, somebody sent a full coconut cake, like uh, from, you know, the uh, Peninsula Grill in South Carolina, which is like, a, like a, an investment, like over $100 <laughs> for a cake. And uh, I thought, wow, like this person really loves me. And it was, it was, fan it was something I'd never do for myself, mm. but it was so, so good. And uh, another friend just sent like a huge amount of, uh, of dim sum. And, uh, and it was just one. me and my son and we just, you know, we made ourselves sick, sick with it. So I just, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, I, I like to just, in those times of trouble, like there's no better excuse for just eating exactly what you want mm -hmm. and right. how much of it you want. And, you know, in whatever, you know, plastic container with your hands, you know, whatever, it, like in front of the television, you know, let, let all of the, uh, manners fall by the wayside. Sure. Um, it's a good segue. I wondered if you could design a meal for these disasters, what would they be? For breakups? <laughs> you know, pizza is my go-to comfort food, and I, w I would definitely make the pizza myself because I think homemade pizza is the best, and, and there would be some kind of green vegetable because even in the, you know, all of the sadness of a breakup, I'm still thinking we need a green vegetable. <laughs> Yeah, all the more. The story that I cited in the introduction about that was the recipe for a breakup disaster was 
I mean, it's a pathetic little meal, but it, um, that's, and, and you know, I don't cook, but it was about being healthful <laughs> to try to take care of myself. Um, and I made it every night for four. I think the lesson here is that I am old and compulsive. I made it for every night for four, four months. Um, but at least I knew that there was a vegetable that it was okay for me. Um, it was steamed spinach and tofu with tamari sesame oil and black sesame seeds and one slice of toast with tofu de cream cheese. <laughs> yep. I don't know. It worked. I'm, I'm going to, again, say cake. I feel like this is my, my go-to for everything. The last breakup I had, I was like, this is the time for me to go and get a gigantic piece of carrot cake. And, you know, it, I remember that as like the... I remember the breakup by the carrot cake and by the whatever it was the next day, you know, the sweets, always the yeah. sweets. Um, what about funerals? Mm. I said uh, finger foods because mm. I read or I heard Terry Gross interview Joan Didion after John Gregory Dunn died. And uh, Joan Didion had been reading Emily Post um, about the etiquette around the bereaved and what one should give someone who is grieving. Sad to think about Joan Didion reading about the etiquette towards herself in that moment, but um, she said Emily recommended finger foods because uh, grieving people are more likely to eat something if you place it in their hand rather than passing them a plate. Yeah. I know, I, so I've stolen that from them. And now I try to bring things that are simple and carryable to people who are unlikely to feed themselves. I had a friend whose spouse was um, on hospice at home, and her mother-in-law is a very proper uh, Southern woman, and she insisted that somebody bring them finger sandwiches from, uh, uh, you know, like toast, basically white bread with the, with the crust cut off and a little bit of something in between and some uh, ham and butter. And uh, that seemed like, I think it's the same. It's, it couldn't be easier to digest or pick up and eat. You don't have to think about it. It doesn't challenge you in any way. You don't, it's not going to burn you or, um, yeah. and she was, you know, I, I see the, the mother now, you know, years later and she, I always remember that you brought those finger sandwiches. Mm -hmm. So it made an impression. If you ever have to bring something to grieving people, I think that is a finger good, uh, just Emily Post, yeah. she knows. Um, if there's time, I was going to read one more entry. I was going to read Simon Doonan's story. Simon taught me a lot about community of all kinds. And I think his story is full of the contradictions and heartbreak and beauty of loss and remembering. It's called A Ritual of Hope. In the early 80s, on a hot, dry afternoon, I drove my friend Mundo to the doctor to get the result of a biopsy. A weird purple lump had appeared on his neck. It's probably just an ingrown hair. The doctor was blunt. This is Carposi's sarcoma. You have AIDS. Can you give my friend a referral to a specialist? There are no referrals. There are no specialists. This disease is fatal. Are you fellows religious? We were not religious. We were young and feral and creative and fun-loving. The epic horror of this diagnosis hit us like a ton of shit. The following day, on the notice board of the Erwan Health Food Store, I spotted a postcard advertising the Michio Kushi Macrobiotic Center in West Hollywood. Listed among the conditions that the macrobiotic diet might alleviate was, drumroll, AIDS. Mundo went to the center and had a cooking lesson, and then I joined him. We learned about the macro philosophy of George Ozawa. One day, Michio Kushi, the macro guru-in-chief, came to the center and gave Mundo a one-on-one -on -one consultation, after which he lit up a cigarette. Mundo was very amused by this. Mundo died a few months later. In the 1990s, I read an article that stated that the macro diet is far too radical for AIDS patients, especially people who make extreme changes from, for example, lardy Mexican food, me and Mundo, to aesthetic Japanese fare. Oh, fuck. After cutting out animal protein, Mundo had lost a dramatic amount of weight. I could have a modeling career, and his lesions proliferated rapidly. I remember sitting in a movie with Mundo and his boyfriend, Jeff. He showed us a couple of sarcomas that had erupted on his wrist. 
during the movie. For a while, I cringed with regret over Mundo's macro interlude, but the truth of the matter is that Mundo was not long for this world, and macrobiotics was the only thing that offered him any kind of hope. The process of preparing his miso soup was a ritual of hope, a simple task that gave him a life-affirming moment in his day. Is, now we're taking questions? Yes? Okay. About five minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question? Yep. Uh, this, <laughs> this is really has nothing to do with green for food, but I would love to hear a little bit, as a fan of yours and a fan of Grant Connect, mm. a little bit about how you two work together. Like, did you sure. give him ideas or did you let him run wild? Like, how was that process? Yeah. Um, Susie asked how I worked with Grant Cornett, who took the photographs for the book. Um, I have known Grant for 20 years, more than 20 years, and um, I have always, we have a shared sensibility. He uh, also has a dead parent, <laughs> and I knew as soon as I met him that uh, our ability to see the beauty and melancholy was the same, and the melancholy and beauty. And. Um, I pitched this project with him in mind. It was contingent really on his photographs that I could realize all the things I wanted to realize about the book. Um, I know his archive well enough to know which photographs would work for which stories. Um, so some of it was drawn from there. There were things that I knew I immediately wanted to use when I got a story back. And then there were other stories that we needed to create images for when those stories came up. Um, I did a lot of, here are three ideas, see which one resonates with you and which one you feel best about executing. And then there were others where he just created an image and sent it to me and said, I think this is for this. There was a few where he created an image and I wasn't sure. Simon was one of them. It's an image of Wakami and I wasn't sold. And he said, just think about it. Just keep it, well, and he went through the exercise of making other images to suit the story, following my direction, and in the end, we came back to the Wakami image. Um, I just talked to him recently, and he said he wished he had made more new images for this book, but I was so happy to use so many things that I had known lived in his archive and would otherwise not have been seen. Um, but I felt the same, like, without these images. The book wouldn't have been nearly as dynamic as I hope it is. Yeah. Do you have a restaurant recommendation um, for a disaster? <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> I suppose I could say I would ask what kind of disaster you're looking for, but I'm I don't want to pry. Um, near not too far from here is Gage and Tolner, which I think is a restaurant that can turn your mood around. Um, on the high end, I was recently at La Rock, which I feel like also is so convivial and incredible that it's hard to have a bad time there. Um, but I also think my son has reminded me that Chinatown is a good place to find something delicious that you didn't expect, which can be distracting enough to take your mind off your disasters. Mm. Yeah. Did you try a lot of his stuff? Did you share some of these things? Did I make things that were in the book and share or, them? Or try them with people you were trying to commission from? I have, no, so, so much of the book was created during COVID, I didn't have the, the question was, um, did I share <laughs> some of these recipes with people who made who wrote the stories? And I, because so many of this, so much of the book was created during COVID, I didn't get to be with people much um, during the time I was receiving stories and recipes. Um, my friend Ryan McLaughlin did the recipe testing and created some of the recipes that are in the book um, when there was not one. And with him, I tried a bunch. But um, I'm sure he's had all of them. And I've, I've actually only probably made a handful, to be honest. Um, but it's really interesting to hear which ones draw people out 
in the course of talking about the book since it's come out, it's it's funny which which things people are prone to try. Are there other questions? Jackie has to go. So I have a 15 year old at home who's grounded. So. <laughs> Does anybody have a recipe for that? <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jackie. And if there aren't any other questions, then thank you so, so much, Lori. Yeah? Any other questions? Great. Thank you guys again. Let's give another round of applause for Larry Allison. Allison's going to be signing at the desk near where my colleague is standing. They're waving right now. If you wanted to line up there to get your book signed, we're going to start breaking down the chairs. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Have a good one.